Hello everybody, today at long last I am getting to drive on UK roads this, the Kia EV6 GT. Now there would have been a time not that long ago where a near 600 horsepower Kia would have likely made front page news. But today such numbers are now so commonplace this is a car that's barely been out a year and it feels like it's already been forgotten. I loved its spiritual predecessor, the Stinger, so on my favourite roads will this deliver the same magic and be a car that you should consider buying? Well, time to find out. <laughs> To date, I have managed to have the pleasure of experiencing an EV6 a couple of times, but both on launch events. The first was here in Britain, where I drove the regular models in the lineup. Then later, we popped over to Sweden to experience the range topping GT. But frustratingly, picturesque, friendly, and EV obsessed though it may be, Sweden is a terrible place to test any performance car. I do seem to recall that the route we were on at certain points had speed cameras every few hundred meters, which for a car that will break the limit in about three seconds is a little bit frustrating. However, now, over a year from that launch, I've finally managed to get some quality time with the EV6 GT and learn what it's like on more familiar tarmac. And I'm happy to say that overall the experience has been a pleasant one, though not naturally without its faults. And I do have to admit, I feel a touch sorry for the EV6, because it feels like it's only just arrived and is already being overshadowed. In fact, even if you were to ignore for a moment all of the many offerings from other manufacturers around the world, you'll find that even within the Kia lineup, this car now has some stiff competition. First off, the EV9 has just been announced, and while that shouldn't beat this car in terms of performance, it is bigger, and for many, that means better. If you're on the hunt for a proper EV family bus, that's likely going to be the one you want, because it's a genuine seven-seater, where I think it'd be fairer to call this really a four, or on occasion, five. And a quick trip to the Kia website tells me they also have an EV3 coming that's likely going to be the volume offering to compare with the likes of the VW ID3, 4, and of course, evergreen stuff like the Tesla Model 3. Tempting though it may be to compare this car with the Tesla equivalent, I am generally of the belief that people on the hunt for an EV either want a Tesla, full stop, or anything but. And so, if you're watching this review, I am going to assume that for whatever reason, you may have decided that a Tesla is not for you. And as it happens, at the point of filming, Tesla have actually withdrawn the Model 3 performance from sale, which was the car I was going to talk about quite a bit. I'm not all that familiar with the Y, and I suspect that's really a closer car to this on account of the rough sizing of it, but in any case, I'm just going to ignore those for now. Suffice it to say, on paper, the Tesla does seem to do quite well. But first, let's talk about the Kia. And the EV6 GT, even not in isolation, is still a mighty thing. The EV6 in of itself is a pretty decent car. I quite like the styling, and when you do park it next to other stuff, you realise it's not anywhere near as big as you might expect. In that regard, it's very much like a Polestar 2. When you see a picture of one, you think, ah, it's yet another SUV type thing. However, when you see it in the street, you realise actually they've tried to keep it as low as they possibly could. The simple fact is, these cars have a shed load of batteries under them, and so you have to raise the floor a bit to accommodate for that. This, to give you an entirely unscientific explanation, is somewhere between an old MG ZS and a Vauxhall Mocha in terms of height. In other words, it's actually not that big at all. You sit down into it, you don't go across or up into it. Stylistically, the people that I've shown this to have said it reminds them very much of a Lamborghini Urus. And if you've just bought a Kia to be told it looks like a Lamborghini, I think you'd be a very happy individual indeed. Inside, the car also has a design language that I think blends a number of somewhat initially disparate looking components into something that actually feels rather cohesive. 
It doesn't do the whole Tesla one dirty great big screen for everything bit, instead having a slightly more traditional dash and then infotainment setup. And for those who aren't fond of the Tesla way of doing things, I think it should work just about nicely. One particularly nice touch is the little row of buttons down here. Ordinarily, I am very anti-touchscreens for things like your heater control, so on and so forth. But Kia have been very clever and they have combined a screen, touchscreen specifically, with a couple of physical dials, meaning that with the push of a button, you can change this from either your basic, you know, nav, map, screen, buttons, all that sort of stuff, over to your heater controls. Then the buttons on left or right, depending on which mode you're in, will do either your temperature or your AM, FM, volume, that sort of stuff. So, good little setup. I like it. It's also fairly refined. It doesn't have double glazing or anything like that, but still, when you're on the motorway, it's not all that bad, wind noise isn't too intrusive, and it's reasonably practical as well. You've got plenty of space in here for your four or maybe five adults. The boot is also a decent size, and you've got a little bit of storage up front too. It is that steering, I think, that I'm really quite taken with. The turn-in is very positive, yet it does still retain just an element of feel and weighting, and though not perfect, you have to still view it in context, it's very good indeed. Your visibility is also pretty decent. The B pillar is a little chunky, but also far enough back, it's not an issue. The A pillar is slightly more problematic, but again, because of where they've placed it, I haven't had any issues. The stereo, I'm not massively fond of. This has a Meridian system, and like many an EV, for some reason, it appears to have given up on the idea of generating any sort of meaningful bass, and that's a shame. I expect simply it's the power-consuming nature of subwoofers that means manufacturers are becoming a little bit wary of them, and I'm annoyed about that. All the rest of it, though, does work very nicely and easily. The screens are both fairly intuitive, and if you're the sort of person that wants to be able to get out of their old Kia and into something like this without feeling overwhelmed, I'd say they've done a fairly decent job. It is that sort of car where should you want to take the grandparents out to lunch at the weekend or have a blast with your mates, it'll do both equally well. The steering wheel then, I think, is actually a fairly clean and very nice design. The two-spoke thing is a, a little bit retro, but all the buttons are still proper, physical, very logically laid out and easy to use. Just below the airbag, you have then on the left your drive mode selector, and on the right, a dirty great big lime green button that says GT. That is essentially a hotkey that will switch you either between GT mode or your individual drive settings. And I like that a lot. As you might have guessed it, GT essentially sets everything to full attack, and then my drive mode is whatever you want. And I have to give the car praise because you can change quite a bit. There are multiple options for the motor, the steering, the suspension, the electronic limited slip differential, which is bespoke to the GT, and your traction control. And this, I think, really does hint at all the things Kia did to turn the EV6 into the GT. When we went on that launch in Sweden, a big part of it was getting shown into this nice dark room filled with little components from the car where they showed us all of the small changes they'd made that otherwise you'd never notice. Even the battery, for example. On paper, it seems the same as in the regular car, both 77.4 kilowatt hour with about 74 kilowatt usable. That gives you a theoretical range of about 260 miles. And in fact, the GT's range was only marginally less than the regular car, and that was on account of the tyres and wheels. But even so, the battery itself is different. It can supply more power. The motors then, naturally, are bigger and beefier. The one at the front here, for example, is more akin to the one at the rear in the regular car. To give you some context of just how big that performance differential is, this is some 80% more powerful than the next fastest EV6. And at 580 horsepower, it is comfortably the most potent Kia ever produced. And as we are currently stuck behind a white van man who is going uncharacteristically slow, I'll take this time to talk about a few of the other things in the car. Naturally, pulling away from a junction and the like is ludicrously easy. The brakes are easier to modulate too, regardless of whether you're on it or not. They also have a couple of different modes separate to your individual settings, and you've got there just normal or sport. 
and to be honest, even normal, I found absolutely fine. The steering has been quickened up from about 2.6 turns lock to lock to more like 2.3. In GT mode particularly, they paid a lot of attention to the feel and the weighting of it because they wanted this to be a car that would appeal to sportier drivers. The suspension then is a semi-active electronically controlled setup which has a number of different modes. And curiously, the front spring rate is actually marginally softer than on the regular car, with the rear being a little bit stiffer. The anti-roll bars have been changed and the whole system has been thoroughly re-evaluated to make sure it suits this car's performance potential and personality. Kia's engineers were actually so dedicated to making this as fun a car as they possibly could, they even gave it a drift mode. Don't ask me how you activate it because I have forgotten and it was somewhat complicated and laborious anyway. But in short, what that does is entirely disengage the front drive and give the rear LSD a bit of a shot in the arm to beef it up, basically make it a tyre slayer. I'm being haunted by Alpines at the minute. In the last week I've seen them about six or seven times. I think maybe the same car a few times, but definitely also a few different ones. Have they done a deal recently on those? Because they were quite rare not that long ago. Regrettably, this week has been yet another where I've had a press car on the driveway and I haven't been able to use it quite as much as I would have liked. I've charged it a couple of times, but on both occasions it was actually using my charger on the driveway, which now, after quite a bit of faffery, actually works once more. I had planned to take it to a public charger and see what it would do, but unfortunately the opportunity never arose. The delivery driver did tell me though that he took it to one of those and, because he set it as a destination, like a Tesla, it will precondition itself so it can take a fairly chunky charge and it was accepting something like 200 to 240 kilowatts, which is pretty good. The literature Kia give you will tell you the car can charge from 10 to 80% in about 18 minutes, provided you can give it a charger that is fast enough. I do feel one of the issues with EVs these days, and it's not really manufacturer's fault, is that they are now quoting the Times 4 said chargers quite a bit, which sound alluring, but currently finding a 350 kilowatt charger is still not the easiest. And even when you have, they won't always actually give you the 350 kilowatts. Also on the numbers front, the combined torque figure here is 740 newton meters. That's just shy of 550 pound foot. In other words, ample. As is tradition with Kia, they don't really do options for the EV6 GT. All you do is pick your trim, for which there is only one here, and then on top of that, you just add your colour. There is a selection of about, I think, half a dozen, and the red is free, but the others cost you about 600 quid. Meaning that this, like just about every other EV6 out there, will have come in at a list price of about £63,500 which I think is not bad for the amount of car that you get. I also appreciate all the little touches in here, from the little strips of green to liven it up, and the fact that these seats are pretty darn amazing. They are manual too, in the name of weight saving, though uh, don't kid yourself, it's still going to be a very heavy car. I couldn't actually find an exact figure from Kia, it simply said TBC, but let's be honest, it's going to be likely about 2.2 to 2.3 tonnes, isn't it? They all are. I must say I'm also somewhat disappointed by the lack of sunroof, but in a more performance orientated model I can kind of see the logic. Back on the topic of the seats though, I do absolutely love them. Really nicely sculpted, still very comfortable though, and when you want to have fun they'll hold you in nicely. And as it happens, we now have ourselves a little bit of clear road. It might be a touch chilly and a little bit damp, but that shouldn't stop me from having fun in the EV6. Let's put it in GT mode, shall we? And see what she'll do. <laughs> oh, this car is fast. Now, I've often said that electric cars, when it comes to performance, really fall into one of two categories. Cars you either get in and go, oh, is that it? And cars where you go, oh my word. And this is the latter. Allow me to demonstrate. Right, let's slow down to about 30 or so. Nice clear bit of road here so we've got good visibility. Okay, so 30 mile an hour, ready, and it's damp underfoot. I'll remind you, here we go. There's 40, there's 50, there's 60.
The official 0-62 time of this is three and a half seconds, but I do recall on the test, Petrol Ped brought along his V-Box, and on a drag strip, I think he managed to beat it. Go. Oh, a bit of slip at the back. What have we done there? 3.37 seconds to 60. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's faster than Kia say. This is a staggeringly fast car, but electric cars being really quick, sort of 0 to 60 particularly, isn't news anymore. Instead, I'm more interested in the subtleties of the drive. And there actually, I have to say, the Kia does pretty well. In its full attack GT mode with everything dialed up to the nines, it's still actually a fairly compliant car. It's firm, certainly, but you can feel the suspension doing its thing. I know quite a few people who would certainly like their suspension being set up this way, but I'm not one of them, so I'm instead going to engage my drive mode, which has nearly everything in Sport Plus, with the exception of suspension, which is in normal, and both the LSD and ESC, which are in Sport rather than Plus. This means there's just a little bit more control and finesse, and they're not trying to be quite so loony. Let's test turn in. Nice. Yep. Grip is good. Now, one thing I will say, it's not the most finessed thing when it does start to get out of shape. You can tell that the traction control is not quite as sophisticated as that you get in, say, a modern day Ferrari, but this is also, I think, about a sixth the price of the last Ferrari that I tested. In fact, this whole car is half the price of the options on the last Ferrari that I tested. And in a 0 to 60 race, I think the Ferrari should beat it. And that tells you how quick this car is. <laughs> oh, it's nuts. And for me, the killing blow of the EV6 GT, well, it would appear that the honeymoon period of EVs is over just a few years ago and people were clambering over one another to get themselves just about anything provided it had batteries in it. But now the law of supply and demand has kicked back in and so I was shocked to see today that there are some 50 EV6 GTs for sale and you can pick one up at about a year old with barely any miles on it for £50,000. In fact there were several at 49999 and when I remember that just last week I drove a Renault Austral, which I said was fairly good value because it was only 40 grand, and that had a terrible hybrid powertrain that struggled to make 200 horses, and this is only 10 grand more, well, you know, used. Yeah. It's a good car. <laughs> I took my girlfriend out in it earlier, and she said she felt like Henry Ford in Ford versus Ferrari. You know the scene I mean, don't you? So then, that is another rather good Kia. I've got to say, I really, really miss the Stinger, and though this is not its direct replacement, it is its spiritual successor. And on that front, I think it does a pretty darn good job of reminding people Kia do know how to have fun as well. So, as ever, a big thanks to them for lending me the car, and of course, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.